you are my personal swing coach, trying to, we'll just keep it PG, unmess up my swing. <laughs> uh, I mean, we don't have to keep it PG, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what we're working on. Um, I found you through Instagram, which you've done really well, and just actually hit the 10,000 followers, which is a big deal. Yeah, thank you. Tell me about uh, how you got into that, the, the whole Instagram thing. Um, so probably three years ago, um, well, no, I guess really four or five years ago, I found uh, George Gankus on just, I was doing like a deep dive just into stuff. Yeah. You know, I was bored on a January day and I didn't have anything going on and I found some of his stuff and I saw he had a, you know, he had a pretty big following, what I thought was big at that time. It was like 5,000 people and he's posting all of his uh, information on there and I thought it was pretty cool. Um, and I, I think I had 100 followers at the time. Um, and it's basically my friends, right? My sure. friends and family. And, uh, you know, so it kind of inspired me to, you know, put some of my information out there and, and shit like that. And, um, you know, so then it, it kind of took off from there. So, uh, you know, the, the big kind of pushes I would get in following would come, uh, from times where I was actually out with George mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I'd play well in a tournament, and then he'd post something about it, and then people would follow me and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then I started uh, working with this guy in uh, D.C., kind of like a social media guru, and, yeah. and talking about how you can build your business through all the different platforms. And the main platform for me that I liked working with was Instagram. You know, he, he kind of talked about Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and all this other stuff, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the most tech savvy guy, so Instagram was always easy for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, taking kind of the stuff, some of the stuff that he gave me in terms of strategies and, um, you know, kind of implementing those things, and I think a lot of it too is kind of luck. You know, it's like when you post and and you know who sees it. It's, you know, the algorithm is so weird with Instagram. I don't think anybody ever really has an idea as to what exactly is going on. Yeah, and. Um, you know, like I used to randomly have a post that one day would get 50 likes and the next day would get a thousand. And then the next day, you know, I'd post a video that gets, you know, 300 views and the next day it gets 15,000. You know, it's just weird. So, um, you know, the, the ones that get the bigger stuff are the ones that obviously helped me and they kind of build it. And I, I kind of dove into Instagram because I figured that's the best way to get my name out there. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's... Um, I would say probably of, of my clientele now, God, probably 85% is through social media. It's crazy. Yeah. I think that it's, that's, that that's the, yeah. the world is now. So, t so it's like, I mean, it's insane. So I'll do, like, it's probably literally 85% is from social. And then, uh, word of, like, the other 15% is word of mouth. Yeah. And the 15% the, the word of mouth, they go follow me on Instagram. And then, then I get DMs of people saying, hey, so-and-so took a lesson from you. They found you on Instagram. I like what you did. Can we try to schedule something? Yeah. yeah you know, it's wild. it's wild. I mean, it's, it's wild. It, it blows my mind. I want to talk more about George, but before that, let's go back. Uh, you came from a golf family, correct? Yes. Tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, my dad taught my brother and I how to play. So I have a younger brother. He is the head pro. His name's Matt. He is the head pro at uh, Country Club of Charleston. Down in South Carolina. Yeah, Most it's a events. it's a it's a pretty neat place. Yeah, so they they actually hosted the U.S. Women's Open in 2019. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know it's a it's a big job. He's he loves it down there. They've been down there for uh, he's been at Charleston now for a little over a year, but they've been down in that area for gosh probably almost ten now. Mm -hmm. So uh, he worked at a place this session before that, and uh, you know he's making his way around. Right. But, uh, yeah, so my, my dad taught my brother and I how to play. I've got uh, baby pictures where I'm three months old in my car seat, you know, in the in the basket in the back of the car as my dad's hitting balls. Uh -huh. um, he taught both my brother and I how to play. Uh, I mean, hell, every memory I have as a kid is us on the golf course. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, us on the, the driving range or going to uh, – driving to a golf tournament or um, – I mean, shit, I feel bad for my mom because my dad took all took us to all those <laughs> things. Yeah. But, um, but it's like it's what he loved, you know. It's like he he always used to tell me he's like, uh, if 
find a job that gives you enough freedom to play golf. Okay. Right? So every job he ever had, he worked to where he could play golf. And so he wasn't a teaching pro. He just he, no, he worked wasn't. a regular job and then he played. So he was, uh, he was, I guess, in the business when he was younger. Uh-huh. So uh, I was born in San Diego, and he was teaching at Torrey Pines, actually. Like, he would just rent. He just randomly taught at Torrey like 35 years ago. Which is a pretty prestigious. Yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, it's probably one of the more famous public places in the United States for uh-huh. sure. Um, now, I don't know if this is him just blowing smoke up my ass, but he told me that he gave Billy Mayfair his first golf lesson. <laughs> is that right? Like 40 we'll go, years ago. We'll with it. Yeah, like <laughs> probably 50 years ago. Yeah. Um, maybe even more. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, that's what I tell people. I think it's kind of cool, yeah. whether it's true or not. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, he taught us how to play. Um, he was a big time student in the game. He loved it. He read all the books. He was a big Hogan guy, and kind of a big Sam Snead guy. So like me seeing George's stuff, mm. uh, George is a big Snead Snead fan. So kind of yeah, that's a connection. What his the way George spoke about things really connected to me because it's the way my dad talked about things. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it was kind of a nice segue. At least That's awesome. Kind of as my dad. So my dad passed when I was uh, seventeen. So it was you know it's kind of nice hearing those things as you get older. And, yeah. Um, you know, it kind of takes you back to old memories. That's crazy. Yeah. But you ended up going to high school in Illinois. Yes. And then from there you went up, got to Methodist University and was it North Carolina? North Carolina. Yeah. I always laugh because when I I did a little research on you a little. Creeping and Methodist, you majored basically. You ever see those uh, NCA commercials where it's like there's three thousand NCA athletes and none of them major in their sport? Yeah. But you majored in your sport. I, I did. Yeah. How yeah. is it? It's it's kind of funny. There's no other sport where you can actually major in. No. So, but you went to college obviously to play golf, but mm-hmm. you knew this is what you wanted to do. That's a, it's a pretty unique major. Now tell me about that. Yeah. So I uh, so I went to Methodist for their professional golf management program. And at the time, I, th- I think, I mean, I think it still is. It was the best one in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, they've had a hundred percent job placement rating in the entirety of the program, like forty years now. It's wow. insane. Um, but so, uh, being from Central Illinois, I checked out which schools were kind of near me, and I actually applied to Ferris State because they had the program as well. Uh-huh. Got in there, and my dad looks at me, and he's like, "You really want to spend?" nine months a year in freaking Big Rapids, Michigan? I'm like, I guess not. <laughs> He's like, you're never going to play golf. It's going to be snowing up there all the time. Yeah. So I uh, then researched where I could play on the golf team as well as be in the program. Uh-huh. And uh, because Methodist was Division three, mm-hmm. they were actually the only one. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Clemson, UNLV, Arizona State at the time, you know, all these big Division One programs that have the golf management program, you can't actually play on the golf team. Is that right? Yeah. Because, huh. so, now I don't know, this was this was 15 years ago, yeah, right? Yeah. But um, the reasoning, the PGA, you have to do, at that time, you had to do internships every summer mm-hmm. at, a golf club, at a golf club or a course, whatever it is that you want to do. And so... Uh, you're basically, your internship was June, July, August, and Methodist started back school early. I had to be back like the second week of August. Mm-hmm. So if I played on a Division One golf team, right, and let's say that they go to Nationals, Nationals isn't until the, like the end of June almost. Mm-hmm. So now you're missing your, an entire third of your, your internship. Right. Um, at Methodist, our national cha- championship finished in uh, the first week of May. Wow. So I was always, uh, I was always at work. Uh, for my internship by like the second week of May and went to the second week of August and went back to school. Do you, knowing what your job entails now or what else you could have done with that degree, is it a, is it a worthwhile degree? Do you need that to do what you do? Um, that's a good question. I've been told depends, that's a good question. Depend, <laughs> depends on what side of the business you want to be in. Okay. Uh, so the golf management program, it runs you through, uh, all the business side of it. Right. So I took, I took golf classes, quote unquote golf classes, like, uh, an intro to club fitting, um, a rules, not a rules and term operations class. Uh, we had an intro to teaching class, 
kind of that stuff. Um, but we had all the business classes as well, so econ and um, statistics and all that jazz, right? So there, it kind of gives you some of the application stuff for the outside world as well in terms mm-hmm. of running the business, which was good. But personally for me, going down the avenue that I went, for just in terms of teaching, I don't think you really need it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, say, the some of the biggest names on you know, Golf Digest list of, yes. of of coaches. I mean, Butch Harmon, the number one guy in the country, is not a PGA member. Genkis isn't a PGA member. You know, so it's like, um, what does it mean to be a PGA member? And let me interlude by saying, uh, we forgot to mention, you were ranked number four in New Jersey this year, which is a pretty big deal. I mean, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's 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 a good honor, whether it's voted by your peers, right? Yes. So yeah. I mean. I, that's amazing. Congrats. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, This was the first year, I guess, that I was nominated, so to speak. Yeah. I guess that I got a, a vote from anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like none of that stuff comes from without social media. Sure. Like I, I, I had uh, I had several friends that I met through social that have been on the list in the past. And they're like, all right, we got to get you on, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so well, what does it mean um, to be a PGA member? You talked about Butch Harmon and George not being. What is that? What is that about? So, a PG the the PGA is is it's I'm pretty sure it's the largest sports organization in the world, mm-hmm. which is crazy to think about. Yeah, right. But we've got twenty nine thousand members. Um, it's basically an organization that um, kind of organizes and promotes the game. You know, they, they, they kind of give us the tools to uh, to help us run our facilities, how to um, bring people into play, how, you know, giving us innovative ideas as to how we can make things better at our clubs. Now, the big plus to being a member of the PGA is you get tournaments to play in, mm-hmm. right? So, um, like I know... Uh, George, who's not a PGA member, he loves to play. He wants to play in all these tournaments, but yeah. they're all run by sec- the the PGA section. Yes. You know, so um, you know, I've got probably twelve to fifteen events I get to play in every year because of that. Right. Right. So um, you know, a big part of what the PGA does as well is they run events for us. Got it. For the yeah. professionals. For the professionals. The teaching pros, and all that the, the teaching pros, the club pros, the. Um, Apprentices, you know, basically anybody that falls under that PGA of America um, umbrella. So, again, another piece of my research. Mm-hmm. Three-time Division Three All-American. Yep. No joke. That's yeah. awesome. Thank you. Um, and did you guys win a national championship when you were there? Uh, we did not, unfortunately. Because so, that, I mean, your schools won, like, tons of them, right? Yeah. Kind so of run the show. We had, uh, let's see, we've done... I think they've won 12 national titles in the last since 1990. Yeah. Um, and they've had the same coach. So he's been, uh, Steve Conley is his name. Uh, he's awesome. But he's been there for like 33 years, I think. Yeah. Um, won 12 national titles. We finished, in my time there, we finished third, third, fourth, and then unfortunately we had one oops a year where we played like dog shit. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but the yeah. thing, so the thing that's funny, and, and other people that are around you talking about your golf game that's interesting, is you were a three-time college All-American, so obviously you can play. But the way that when you talk about your old swing to like now, it's like you it's you might as well not even have played back then. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. tell me about your process, because again, someone that, uh, you know, a collegiate All-American, you're obviously better than 99.9% of people at any level, but you talk about your swing now as being so much different, better, and, and what's changed in your game, or take us through that, because I think for someone like me, who's like the, an amateur amateur, is like, you know, what the hell, what's the difference? You know, it's uh, it's funny, so literally a lesson I had an hour ago, the guy was asking me, he says, you know, because we were talking about how long it takes to like progress and get better at something, and you know, my game has really taken kind of a turn in the last, say, four years, He's like, well, what do you work on now? I was like, dude, I'm still working on the same shit that I was working on two years ago. Like, it's, it's not ever changing. You know, I, I work my ass off, but it takes forever. You know, and kind of where I was before, I never really had uh, 
I mean, my dad taught me growing up, and he had a lot of those it's like same characteristics that I talked about that George teaches as well. But then, you know, I got to college, and, you know, I was working with somebody, and, you know, they have their own philosophy, and then outside of college, another person had their own philosophy, and then their own for another person. So, you know, for me, it, it was trying to find the right path for kind of me and how I wanted to, say, move the golf club. Yeah. And, you know, when I look back at it now, when I see videos of my stuff from, you know, five and six years ago, I'm like, holy shit, I can't even believe I broke 80. Really? You know, just because, um, you know, a lot of it was timing based. So when I was playing, when I was playing well, you know, my timing was really good and I could, you know, I could compete with anybody, almost anybody. And, uh, you know, my fundamentals weren't that good. My technique was, you know, so, so at best. And, uh, you know, once I kind of dove into George's stuff, I was like, okay, this guy like knows what he's talking about. Like I need to, if I really want to play the golf that I want to play, the rest of my life, like I gotta do some shit to change. Yeah, and, and, so, and so you worked on that the last few years. Oh, it's more than I, um, probably more so work in terms of with a purpose mm -hmm. um, than ever. And and a part of it too for me, I was also never really taught as a kid or even in the college, like how you go about practicing, how you go about. Um, trying to improve and the things I, like I always just thought it was beating balls because that's what my dad did. Like my dad beat balls for freaking hours. And so I just beat balls next to him. That's yeah. what I thought, right. you know, and now learning so much from, I mean, through social, through reading, through all this other stuff, how people learn and, and stuff like that. It's, yeah. it's so much more about the quality of the time that you have yeah. versus the quantity. And, and that's what I've kind of taken to heart in my own game now. Because, you know, I might get, I might have somebody that's run 10 minutes late for a lesson, so I'll, I'll get in 10 minutes, but I actually work those 10 minutes yeah. instead of just aimlessly hitting 50 balls or, you know, 10 balls, whatever it is. So let's get a little more specific into that for, you know, the golfer that might be listening. I go to the range all the time, and there's guys there, and 99% probably just beat balls, and they go there, and oh, they're yeah. spending their 10, 15 bucks, and they have fun for an hour. So in general, like, how would you want someone to approach it? You know, the thing with golf is that you could you could spend 10 hours on anything, putting, driving, short chip, long chips, mm -hmm. different lies, sand. Yep. How would you instruct someone to say, like, you know, okay, I'm going to the range for an hour. What, what the heck should I do? Uh, first thing is go with a plan, right? Figure out what it is that you want to do that day. Most people, like you said, they go and they, they buy their bucket of balls and then they throw them in the slot or the, the little container that holds the balls and they just rifle ball to ball to ball to ball. And they don't think about shit. Yeah. You know, so I preach, at least I try to preach to everybody that one, you go with the plan. And then two, let's figure out step two, what, whatever the plan is. So let's say you want to go on a particular day and you want to work on your backswing, mm -hmm. right? So then from there, you've got to figure out or you got to go back and run through some of the stuff that you've worked on in terms of what allows your backswing to improve, right? Whether it's your pivot, pressure shifts, arm structure, uh, club face angle, wrist angle, whatever it is, right? And then hopefully you have a couple drills or a bunch of drills, whatever it is that you can work on. So then what I would say is if you have an hour, I like to do, um, I like to have my players do like 15 minutes of block practice, mm -hmm. right? So block practice is you are just solely working on positions. Um, it's kind of the more tedious stuff that at times sucks for people, but it also helps you change that motor pattern, mm -hmm. right? So spend 15 minutes working on that block practice. Mm -hmm. Then I will say your next 15 minutes, um, and, and I should say the first 15 minutes where you're, you're grinding out positions, you're still hitting the golf ball. Right, you're not just working the position and not hitting the golf ball. Right, so you're always going to hit the ball. And then the next 15 minutes, I would say uh, do like a, a group of two balls. First ball, you would do your block practice, practice swing, or however you want to think of it. And then your second ball, you're going to do like a, a one motion slow motion. Right, and then from there, your next one, uh, your next 15 minutes, you're going to do uh, the block practice like freezer, slow motion, then you're going to do a one motion, slow motion, and then you're going to do um, a normal shot, mm -hmm. 
right? You're going to do that for 15 minutes. Hit a normal golf shot. And then your uh, last 15 minutes, you're going to get rid of all technique whatsoever, and you're just going to try to hit golf shots, right? So you're going to hit uh, every shot, though, is going to be with a different glove. I don't care if you hit it like a freaking tour star, if you hit it like fucking shit. It mm-hmm. does not matter, mm-hmm. right? You have to... Uh, basically teach yourself on the range to start to hit golf shots, mm-hmm. right? So you're going to hit your driver, then you're going to hit your 8-iron, then you're going to hit your sand wedge, and then you're going to hit your 7-iron. Then you're going to hit your 4-iron, then you're going to hit your pitching wedge, right? You're going to work through that, and then you work through that for 15 minutes. And um, a lot of times I'll give my players games to play, right? So um, whether I want them to do a, a distance control game or a crossing pins game or um, whatever it is, so that they're they're starting to hit shots that are meaningful, mm-hmm. you know, so that, you know, you kind of go full circle in that hour. You know, you do a lot within that hour. And the nice thing is, it's not all the same. Like, people get bored as shit when they just go and hit balls for an hour. Yeah. Right? By 35 minutes in, they're like, all right, I'm done. I'm ready to go home. Yes. Yeah. So now you're breaking it up into four different distinct parts, doing four different things, still while hitting a golf ball, still while working on technique, but then you finish it by actually hitting real golf shots. How would you talk to someone that, you know, they work, maybe they play around every weekend, but they say, listen, I got two hours during the week. Um, you know, me and my dad always talk about this. He hates to practice, loves to play. If he had two hours, he'd rather go play nine. Mm-hmm. I actually like doing the range and practice. Mm-hmm. What's the, is it, at some point, do you, should you just go play because you got to get on the course versus, hey, I'm, you know, me specifically, I'm trying to work on all these things. When I get to the course, like I'm not really, I'm just going to hit play. So how do you, how do you talk about that? Um, that's a good, that's a good point. I think part of it is, I don't think there's a right answer. Mm-hmm. I think it's totally dependent on the person, right? So if you're a guy that likes to go hit balls and work on positions and structure and stuff like that, that's what you should do. But be mindful that golf is also played on the, on the golf course. Yes. Right. Um, I think if your dad wants to go out and just you know, play nine holes in two hours and, and or play as many holes as he can in two hours and, and do his thing and, and I think that's that has a lot of merit too. So the way I would look at it is um, one, you gotta figure out what works best for you. And then two, whether you're the guy, the first guy that just wants to hit balls, mm-hmm. you gotta figure out a way to work in playing time. Mm-hmm. You have to. Because mm-hmm. there's there's no substitute for actually being on the ball. Has there ever been a time where you really had to make some big swing changes with somebody where you like don't want them to go play because they're just going to screw up what you're working on? I've never told anybody not to play. Okay. So you're always wanting to get out there? Always. always. Yeah. And a lot of, I mean, that's easier to say with the kids that I have because kids are instinctual and they just, they figure shit out. Mm -hmm. Adults aren't. Right. right? Adults are... uh, at times more analytical and, and if something doesn't go right on the first shot they're like fuck it I'm done you know I'm over it so and then they go back to whatever they used to do to try to get the ball to go where they want it to go yes you know exactly. versus yeah I mean there are growing pains as, as there are with anything mm-hmm. you know so um, it's it's never a, there's never a time where I wouldn't want you to play you won't have to get out there always always I mean, there's times where, I mean, I've done some, some say, I mean, I'm fortunate. I have people that will come for two or three hours at a time, and there's been some stuff where we've done some dramatic things within the first hour mm-hmm. or the first hour and a half, and then, you know, they want to just sit on the range and grind for the next hour and a half to finish the lesson, and then I take them on the golf course. Right? right? Part of it, too, is to switch it up. Like, their brain needs to re-trigger or to, to uh, not re-trigger, but, uh, kind of rework itself into getting out of just focusing solely on movements yeah. and, and positions and say, okay, let's take the feels that we've created in our, in our session thus far and try to translate into the golf course. Um, I want to talk about, you mentioned this guy, George, a lot. Of, you know, I think I found him before I found you on YouTube. He's, people ask me about him. I said he's the guy that teaches golf lessons and slides and, and a flat brim hat. Gucci slides, man. So he's... He's obviously kind of like stuck his middle finger up a little bit to the golf establishment, which I think a lot of people appreciate. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because as I look at it, it seems like what he teaches is quite a bit different, but he also says, like, it's I just go based on the player. But 
I will say I was at the range. I didn't tell you this. I was at the range two weeks ago, and I was doing some of our drills, and this guy walked by me and goes, George Genghis? So there's obviously <laughs> something to the stuff he's teaching yeah. that people know. Yeah. What is it about? And so George was ranked a top 10 teaching pro. He's got, now he's got Akshay, who was the top amateur, and he's got Matt Wolf. Who, uh, he's worked with a lot of people. But what is it about what he does from your perspective that is different, isn't different, that kind of has, has, has changed the not change the game totally, but it's a new element that I think it hasn't been around. Or... So I think where George, for, he's just a cool dude. Like looks he's, like a skater. He's, yeah, yeah, like yeah. like skater, surfer dude. Um, but he's smart as hell. He is a savant. He is insanely smart. Um, I've been lucky to spend some time with some, you know, big names in the teaching business. And they're all great, don't get me wrong. But George like hasn't, he just, he sees it. Like he can see it and he can get the person to change and he can like literally get the person to change in three swings. You know, it's, it's he has just this knack for saying the right thing at the right time to that person that gets them to move to the way that he wants to make a change. You know, and um, you know, I kind of saw that through his social and then I saw it in person when I, you know, the times I've been out there and it's, it's like, it's freakish. You know, the guy is, um, what you see on social and, and those platforms is who he is. He is probably one of the, I mean, he's one of the like kindest, like most endearing guys that you would ever really meet. You know, yeah. he, I mean, I've heard him on other podcasts and, you know, usually the, the, the host is asking the questions and stuff like that and George like flips it and asks the guy questions. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like you can tell he's genuine in, in everything he does and I think that's why so many people are attracted to him is because right. he's real. Now you are, a, is it a George Genghis certified instructor? I mean, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so, um, so I saw kind of a need, so to speak, for um, kind of his information on the East Coast, you know, uh, there have been people in, uh, so I used to work in New York, mm -hmm. and there were people in my area that knew I'd spend time with them and knew I'd talk to them and kind of had seen that I had been implementing some of the, his stuff into my own game, and they would ask me questions, and, and so I went out to California and asked them if he did any certification programs, and he said that he was going to, and he was working on it, and I kept bugging, he said, you know, get back to me in a month. And I got back to him a month, and he's like, I'm just, I'm too busy right now. And I kind of kept bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. And he's like, listen, man, just at this point right now, I just don't have the time to do it. And I said, okay, no problem. So then I uh, reached back out to him like six months later, and he was going down to this coach camp down in South Carolina. And I went solely down just to talk to him about this. Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, man, there are 10 million people in the Northeast that play golf, right? And there's a huge number of them that love what you do and want your information. It's just, they might not necessarily want to fly to California. Mm -hmm. He's like, all right, you make, he's like, you're right. So uh, I said, now I want to be the guy on the East Coast that can help these people. Mm -hmm. He's like, okay. I said, the only thing is you got to certify me. He's like, all right, let's do it. So he knew that I knew his stuff because mm -hmm. I mean, I, I Everything that he's done on YouTube, everything on his, his old membership site, you know, I, I went through all that stuff, everything. Went through every Instagram video he ever did. Yeah. And, I mean, I knew his shit. So mm -hmm. he said, okay, you got to come out, spend a week with me. Um, and I, I want to see, I want you to see how I diagnose, how I go about doing things within a lesson and, and go from there. And that's kind of where we, kind of where we went. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And that's and, how that all happened. Yeah. And it's 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 neat because now uh, if he does have somebody that I mean, he's 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 very good to me. I don't know why he decided to be so good to me, but I'm I'm lucky, you know. And uh, so now anytime anybody contacts him about something on the East Coast, he always gives him my name. That's awesome. Which is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for you, you built this business where through Instagram you're at Hamilton Farm, which is an awesome place. Um, in your business or in your personally, like what, you know, what's the next step or what, where do you want to go? Is it teaching guys on the tour? Or is that not fun to you? Talk to me about that. So 
what got me excited about teaching was seeing how George works with so many young players and then like helps them make their high school team and then they go to college and you know then they uh, you know they're all Americans in college and they're turning professional and that type of stuff so Matt Wolf. Matthew Wolf yep. um, Akshay uh, Spencer Sussman like all these cats that he has mm -hmm. um, and like that was cool to me mm -hmm. so I've tried to you know I kind of have like I have my adult clientele that you know, I know they want to work and they want to grind mm -hmm. and, you know, but they don't necessarily have the time that the kids have, you know, and the kids are like my labor, labor of love. Mm -hmm. You know, I, if I could get, if I could have a hundred juniors, you know, that come in and, and I just work with juniors every day and like, that would be so cool, mm -hmm. you know, seeing them, um, progress as they get older and the things that change and, and how they're able to do things differently from year to year and, and, Plus, they're, they're excited, like they're super excited and they want to work and they want to get better. And, um, you know, it's an insanely uh, competitive sport, especially when you're talking about going to college and stuff like that. So, you know, I kind of wanted to be the guy that helps them achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. You know, that's great. Yeah. Um, one thing I didn't know, I was surprised, you know, being in the Northeast, we always think like, oh, everyone goes to Florida or the Carolinas to play golf. And you said, no, no, no. Like, Tri-state area is the place. Oh yeah. Tell me about that, the history or anything like that that I don't think most people realize. I mean, Cause that's why you it, came up here. Yeah. Oh yeah. Out here from wherever. Yeah. So um, prior to being up here in the Northeast, I was working in the mountains of North Carolina, and then I worked down um, in South Florida at two insanely good places. I mean, I've been very lucky, mm -hmm. and so. Um, it was time for me to move on, and there was a job that came open at this place in the east end of Long Island, Friar's Head. And I had, I had never heard anything about it, didn't know what it was. And one of the guys I worked with was like, dude, you got to work there. They have a keg in the fucking golf shop. <laughs> like, you, you, go, you, like you, get a, you get a drink beer all day. I'm like, okay. I'm not a big beer guy, but it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. So then I do some research on the club, and it's this insanely cool place. And, um, you know, I didn't really know kind of what was up here until I got here. I was lucky enough to get this job as the first assistant at Friars Head at 25. And uh, probably had no business getting the job, but I did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as I get up here and I'm like, holy shit, like all these places were playing for tournaments. I mean, 20 minutes from Friars Head, you have Shinnecock, National, uh, Sabonic, Southampton Golf Club, uh, Atlantic, Maidstone, East Hampton, I mean, that's just in that. That's just, just east right there. of there, right? Yeah. Those are all within 30, 30 to 45 minutes. Then you go western, you know, part of Long Island, you got the Creek, uh, you have uh, uh, you have the Creek Club, you have Piping Rock, you have Meadowbrook, you have Deepdale, you have all these insanely historic places. Then you go into Westchester and you have Westchester Country Club, which is like the mecca, I think, in this uh, well, that and uh, Wingfoot are like two of the best golf clubs in the freaking world. Mm -hmm. Like if I had, if I could join one place, it'd either be Wingfoot or Westchester Country Club. Two golf courses. It's phenomenal. Insane amount of history. Um, you know, so it's. I mean, then you get in New Jersey and you have you know places like Ridgewood and Plainfield and uh, Baltusrol. I mean, Baltusrol. I mean, come on. You know, so uh, you know there is. There might be more concentrated golf in other parts of the country, in South Carolina and, and Georgia and North Carolina and Florida, but when you're talking about like concentrated, unbelievable golf, like the over history, you know, it's here. You know, it's it, you just you can't you can't beat it, man. It's just it's phenomenal. What was it like living on the East End, Long Island? You were there for a while. Huh? Yeah, I was there for five years. I I loved it. Were you there in the winter too? No. No, so I, I was a I was a twenty five year old snowbird man. So I would. Uh, this is cool actually because there's a lot of people don't. I didn't realize this either. The life of many, you're a little unique and you stay here all year round. Now I do now, yeah. Family. But tell about what your life was like back then. So um, I lived the dream, man. So I would. I was a I was a nomad basically. So I would work for six months in one place, pack all my shit up, go to Florida. Mm -hmm. I was there for six months and then come back. So uh, when I was at Friars, 
uh, I guess seven months. So we had a seven month season at Friarside. Then I would pack all my stuff up. I'd go down to Palm Beach, and then I would play mini tour stuff all winter. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was lucky. I got some some help from the membership there at at Friar's Head, and I mean, I didn't work. I literally, I only worked on my game. I played probably from basically middle of November to April one every year. I probably played sixty tournament rounds. I mean, I played everything I could possibly play, in. and uh, they loved it. Like. This yeah. is also the only part of the United States where, like, a golf pro is a real golf pro. You like, you teach, you play. Like, the clubs want you to play. Right. You know, it's like Hamilton Farm and Friars Head, they, I mean, they pay for my entry fees in all of our section events because mm -hmm. they want me to go play. Why? Because they want, they, they want, well, it looks good for the club. You know, they want the club to be represented in these these events. And you won a few events a year ago, two years ago? Uh, in 2018, I won our... The clam bake, which is like our first major of the year, and then I won the uh, fall finale, which is our kind of like quote unquote tournament champions type thing. Yeah. So you're going up all against the other club pros in the section. In the section, yeah. So it's obviously some pretty high level guys. So yeah, yeah. Is, is I mean, deal. yeah, we've got uh, Tyler Hall is is the stud. You know, he's he's been our player of the year the last few years, and. Um, you know, we got Pat Fillion, who's at Echo Lake, who's a baller. Uh, Grant Surgeon at Ricola, who's a stud. Mm -hmm. You know, Grant's played in, uh, Grant's won the Met Open, which is a huge deal. Tyler's won the Met Open, too. You know, I think Grant's played in, like, four or five PJ championships. So what? Like, it, it, so most people that are casual golf fans see, like, you know, majors on TV. Um, so you're a guy at the, at, the, at the PGA pro level who can, you know, win that tournament. What's the difference between you and an average tour player? Like, is it leaps um, and bounds? Is it distance? Is it putting? Or what's the difference? They manage their game. Well, I would no. They they manage their mistakes. No, how do I want to say this? Um, everybody makes mistakes on the golf course, right? But theirs are more manageable than mine, right? So if I hit a drive, if I hit a poor drive, I might hit a poor drive out of play. That cost me two shots. Yeah, their poor drive is in the rough. Got it. Right. So, um, you know, and, and their their wedge game is a little bit better than mine, and they're you know they're a little better putting, uh, putting from, you know, say inside fifteen to twenty feet, that type of stuff. Um, kind of the stuff that takes you from a, you know, mid range or higher higher level club pro to, you know, a tour player. Got it. And then the guys that are. The elite tour pros, I mean, they do all the stuff that the average guys do, but they also hit it freaking a lot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. the whole name of the game now is distance. How far can you hit it? Doesn't even have to be straight. You just got to make sure that you keep it in play and hit it as far as you can. Right. And that's, the, I read it was, was a golf digest. They were talking about, the, I don't remember who it was, middle of the road tour player. And they're like, what's the difference? And he's like, I will never hit the ball as far as Rory. That's the problem. Yeah. Yep. It's 20, 30 more yards off the tee than I am. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a, there was a stat, I think, somebody did it on Instagram, I saw, but there was, uh, it was like the the average distance of a tour player, so if you were, uh, the average money that they made for the year, mm -hmm. right, so if you averaged over 310 yards, the average player that did that made three and a half million dollars. Mm -hmm. If you were from like 295 to 309, you made like one point two million dollars, mm. and then if you were under, you know, two ninety two hundred ninety four yards and less, it was like six hundred thousand. Wow. You know, so if you don't hit it over three hundred, and then especially three ten plus, I mean, you're getting lapped. Right. By everybody. Let's talk about you know the average amateur golfer. What do you see if you know? And again, this is such a general question, but the guy that shoots mid nineties, what'll get him to high eighties? Like in general, putty. Number one, putting. Number one, yeah. Okay. Everybody comes in, and they say, you know, I say one of the first things I ask is, you know, what do you shoot on average? And they say, oh, ninety six. I say, well, what do you want to shoot? They say, I want to break ninety consistently. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay. And then I say, how do you feel like we're going to make that happen? They say, oh, well, I need to be more consistent with my iron play and this and that. And I say, okay. How many putts do you usually have? How many three putts? So like, oh, I have eight three putts around. I'm like. Well, guess what? If you shoot 96 and you get rid of all your three putts, you just shot 88. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. And 
it's really not, not that it's not that hard, but putting is the most, I think, skillful part of, of, of the game. And it can be one of the harder things to, to become good at. Yeah. But it's the most necessary. Right, right, right. You know, it's, you know, tour players, putting now is, you know, the guys that are the longest drivers or the guys that are making the most money, they're not necessarily the best putters. But if you can be... Right. Would you say the same thing if you are a high 80s to get to into the low 80s? Is it still putting or now you start to change? Typically, yeah, because, uh, well, I guess I, it kind of depends on how it is that you work and what it is you work on. You know, so if you're the guy that's the mid-90s guy and you grind your ass off on your putting and you go from 43 to 44 putts around to now you're at 37, 38, mm -hmm. you know, you're probably not going to go from 37, 38 putts to 32 putts. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So then I would look at two areas. What do you do around the greens when you miss the green, right? So are you able to actually skillfully get the ball onto the green and within a distance that is potentially makeable? Yeah. And then are you able to keep it in play off the tee? Right. Right, so if you can't keep it in, if you can't keep it in play off the tee, you're not gonna putt a ball out of bounds. Right. I'm never seeing that happen, <laughs> okay? But you can hit a ball. Yeah, yeah, you can hit a baby. Yeah, probably. Right. So uh, once the putting is taken care of, we look at the chipping, pitching, stuff like that around the greens to see if you can at least get it on the green and you know within a serviceable distance. Yes. Then it's what do you do off the tee, right? right? If you can't find a if you can't find the earth to save your life, then you go there. Right. So that guy that's probably the 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 mid. You know, mid to high 80s guy that's looking to get into the low 80s or even, you know, maybe break 80 every once in a while. Yeah. That guy's going to first make sure that he takes care of his putting, make sure that he can get a chip or a pitch within the vicinity of the hole, mm -hmm. and then he's got to make sure he can get off the tee. Right. Yeah. So if he can do those other things, if he can do those three things, the iron play stuff is far less, I wouldn't say far less important, but it's it takes a lot of pressure off. Right. Right. And then when you have parts of your game that are really good, it takes a lot of pressure off the other parts. Right. Is it common? I've always felt that, you know, I didn't grow up, I haven't played a ton of golf. Um, but even when I went out and played without a ton of golf, I always felt that my 8 9 pitch, very comfortable, even if I hadn't sold in a while, but the higher, longer clubs, it was like, holy shit. Like, I don't know what's about to happen. Is that normal? Uh, yeah. Because shorter clubs are just easier to hit. Whether you got weird shit that you do or not, Right, the shorter clubs are always going to be easier. The driver's going to be the hardest because the thing's on a tee, and you have to hit it completely differently than you hit an iron. Yes, you know. So if somebody has struggles with a driver, you know, if you take some time off and come back to it, you're still going to struggle. Yep. You know, but um, you know, most anybody can pick up an eight iron or a nine iron or a pitching wedge after some time away and and you know fashion something together to to hit a golf ball. But because the clubs do get longer, there's less loft on them as well. And then the longest club, the driver, is already off of the tee. And you, you have to hit up on the driver versus hit down Yes. to, to kind of maximize what you do. So, um, yeah, the longer stuff is definitely harder. Right. That's pretty common. Yeah, very common. What are the most common things that you see? I mean, I see, I've, I've watched you teach a bunch of times and we've laughed at it. It's usually the same three or four things. But if someone's on their own and trying to figure out their swing, what are the three or four things they should pay attention to? Um, first thing would be body pivot, how your body's moving. So as you rotate in the backswing. As you rotate in the backswing. So I, as I've learned more and more and more about, you know, everything within the golf swing, I'm a big believer that the backswing is going to set up your downswing. And then the downswing is a bit of a chain reaction to the backswing. So if my backswing is in good positions, my downswing is typically going to react the way that we want it to, mm -hmm. or, or very similar to what we want to see. If the backswing is jacked up, right, you're going to have to do some crazy shit on the downswing to try to fix it. So um, the first thing I tell people to look at is uh, well, kind of one and one A. One would be club face. Club face tells the, the story for everything. Right, so if my club face position is off, I mean, I could have the most perfect, beautiful, technical golf swing in the world, but if my club face is off, it don't freaking matter. I'll still hit it like shit. Yeah. Um, and then two from there, 
um, body pivot. Right? Making sure that the body is rotating in a fashion that allows the club to get into the positions that you would need to to uh, to shallow the club on the downswing and to to get the body to rotate and on the downswing and to get into a nice impact position and and all that good stuff. For those out there that think about golf as like kind of like the unathletic sport, um, do you have trouble teaching guys that come in that don't have mobility, aren't very strong? Is it is it a challenge when they can't get in the positions you want? Um, it's a challenge for them. It's not a challenge for me in the sense that I welcome it. I like I kind I enjoy it in the sense that. I have to come up with a different way to figure out how I'm going to get this guy to go, mm -hmm. to, to move, yeah. right? I could, I could have, you know, I could have 10 kids that come in that are like Gumby and I can get them to do whatever I want them to do. Yeah. But then, you know, the guy in corporate America that sits in his office all day, you know, he might not have the, the hip flexibility or the, uh, you know, he might have a bad back or the thoracic, you know, whatever it is, right? So. Uh, those guys are fun for me too because I've got to figure out what verbal cue I can give. Typically, I'll work through six or seven different scenarios within a lesson. Like, people walk away and they're like, dude, you talked about so much, it's so technical. Yeah. I actually didn't. We talked about one thing, and then I talked about six different ways to get you there. Yeah. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to filter through those six different things that get you to move the way that you're actually able to go. It's so funny you say that, and one of the reasons why I love watching you teach and why I started watching George was because so much of what he talks about relates to what we do every day, correcting people's movement. But what I tell people very early on when I start working on core position and all stuff, I said, listen, I know this sounds like a lot, but I'm actually teaching you one thing, and we just have to figure out how to incorporate it into six or seven other things. Yeah, so it actually yeah. isn't a lot of stuff, <clears throat> but it feels like it is. Yeah, people, you know, I, I think what, what happens is people will walk away from a session, they'll be like, I did, I can't remember what I did because we did so much. But if we really break it down and look at it, I mean, in, in a lesson that I, in an hour lesson, you're gonna get probably five or six different things, but they're all pertaining to the same subject. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the pivot, whether it's arm structure, whether it's club face angle, whether it's wrist angles, whatever it is, right? I'm just trying to figure out what, what verbal cue I can give you and then what feel you can create to make it happen on your own. Mm -hmm. Got it. And if somebody can understand that and can walk away with that feel and that understanding that there's a feel that we're trying to create, um, then typically they're they're okay. All right, some random questions. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite course you've ever played? Ooh. Because they have two greens on every hole. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, very cool. What were you doing out there? So I played in, a, a, it was USA versus Japan. It was the Fuji Xerox USA versus Japan collegiate matches. Okay. <laughs> yeah, big name. Yeah. In 2008. So they took uh, four men, four D1 guys, uh -huh. uh, two Division two guys, an NAIA and a Division three. I was a Division three guy. That's so cool. And then we had four D1 girls. Uh -huh. So we played, so the 12 of us played, I think that number adds up, right? So the 12 of us played the 12 Japanese team members. Yep. And uh, we played Tokyo Golf Club. We were there for a week, and it was awesome. How cool is that? So cool. How did you play compared to some of the D1, D2 guys? Uh, so uh, let's see. We, we had three tournament rounds. I shot uh, – so it, they were stroke play matches. So mm -hmm. the first two matches, you played with a teammate, and then the last one was a singles. Mm -hmm. So um, – I shot 72 in round one. My partner shot 69, and we got destroyed. <laughs> the guys we played shot 68, 67, I think. Then the second match, um, my partner shot, I think he shot 71, and I played like shit. I played, I shot 77, and we got destroyed again. And then my last round, uh, I shot 68 and beat up on the, um, ended up beating their collegiate, their Japanese collegiate champion. That's great. Um, he didn't play good that day, but uh, but we as a team we ended up winning, which is kind of cool. Yeah. You know? So, cool. but it's pretty neat. I mean, of the um, of the guys that I went with, actually, three of the four girls play on tour. One of them's one. Of the guys, 
Uh, let's see. Actually, I'm the only guy that went into like the golf side of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of them won the U.S. Mid Am last year. Kevin Chapel. Wow. I'm, I'm not Kevin Chapel. Uh, oh my God, his name's blanking me right now. Shit. But he won the U.S. Mid Am last year. Okay. Um, then uh, we had another guy who's won on tour. Another guy who uh, has been on tour for like five or six years. Um, yeah, I mean, they've all, another guy at this point on the web.com, you know, awesome. so, yeah, I mean, it was it, it was pretty cool to kind of see those guys and how, and girls really too, I mean, the girls were insanely good. Yes. Um, but to see kind of how they work, yeah. you know, and, and I could definitely see that they worked differently than I worked. Okay. You know, when we're in practice rounds and, and uh, you know, warming up prior to playing and kind of their whole process. It was a good learning experience for me. It sucked that I was a senior and I was mm-hmm. done. Yeah. You know, it was my last collegiate event that I played in, but um, it was kind of neat to see how, how they ran things. And, and I was actually the oldest, so I was a senior. Everybody else was either a freshman or sophomore. Wow. So on the on the men, men's and women's side. So it's kind of neat because the younger crowd got selected for this, and then the older crowd got like the – you know, the Curtis Cup and the Palmer Cup mm-hmm. and like those bigger uh, collegiate tournament or amateur tournament type team events. What's your course you most want to play that you have? Augusta. Think it'll ever happen? I hope so. Okay. So I was, uh, I guess, fun fact, I was born on April 14th in 85, final round of the Masters, Bernard Long and won. My dad would name me Bernhard, my mom's like, you're freaking nuts. <laughs> so, um, you know, so every year my birthday kind of falls on the, right around the, the Masters. So it's yeah. always, that has always had like a near and dear place in my heart. Yeah. And it's always, that's the, if anybody's out there and they, they remember, like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the only place. Yeah. That's, that's it. place you want to go. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So. What's a favorite club in your bag? Ooh, good question. Um, probably my driver. Yeah. I've worked on I've worked on that club more in the last probably three years, just in terms of hitting, figuring out a shot shape that I can hit every single time. Because mm-hmm. that that at my level, that's the big thing. I got to have a shot that I can hit every single time off the tee, no matter what. Yeah. Um, I had to work on some club face stuff to make sure that I was able to do that. And uh, now it's it's probably the best part of my game. It's the best asset in my game. Whereas three and four years ago, it was the worst. I had no idea. Really? No idea. Zero. It's amazing to think about the scores you shot and to think you don't know where that would go. It was all timing. Yeah. Like the, the days where, or say the, the, the days where I had good practice sessions prior to the actual tournament, yeah. I had good feels going into the tournament and then I could make it happen. You know, but now it's, you know, I could go weeks without touching the club or, or months really and I could pick it up and still do the same thing because my, my technique is that much better. What's your favorite golf win you ever had? Um, in college, well, I guess I, that's a good question. Um, in college, we always played a tournament at, uh, in Jekyll Island at, uh, uh, they, they have, uh, two courses down there, the Oleander and I can't remember the other one that we never played it. But so, uh, my junior year in college, I had, I shot like 68, 70, I think the first two rounds, and I had like a, I mean, I probably had like a five shot lead with five holes to play. Mm-hmm. And I go, I went uh, bogey, bogey, par, bogey, bogey, par, par, bogey to finish. Mm-hmm. And the guy I'm playing against goes birdie, par, birdie, par, birdie, and like nips me by a shot. And so that one stung. And then the next year, I come back from my senior year, and I think I shot 68, 71, 70, something like that. And I think I won by like four or five. Nice. So it was, yeah, that, that's probably the one that I remember the most just because it, because um, that was always my favorite tournament, being that Jekyll Island. Like it was spring break, it was, the weather was always good. Like the weather finally turns a corner. You know, we're in shorts finally because the weather's nice. and. Mm-hmm. You know the, the golf course is set up to my eye, mm-hmm. and uh, 
to want to win that off, you know, every time I was there and then to have a really good chance one year and then to, to lose it and then come back and, and get it the next year was, yeah, I, I remember that one. Yeah. Do you have another memory, maybe that either wasn't a win, but your favorite golf memory? Um, favorite golf memory? Um, I remember playing uh, this parent child with my dad and I used to, I used to be a hothead when I was a kid, like <laughs> throwing clubs, not, th uh, I mean, I probably did throw a club <laughs> or two or two <laughs> and you know, I'm like 13 and cursing up a storm and stuff like that. And I'll never forget. We were playing in this parent child and, um, like I was in a mood, like I was just pissed. I was not playing good. My dad was holding me together and, um, I hit this one shot on the 13th hole at Ironwood Golf Course. This little, not a muni, not a little muni, but a public course back home. Mm -hmm. And I hit this thing miles right on this par three. I mean, it was almost in this shit. It was, it was a terrible lie. I remember seeing my dad grind his ass off, and he hits this pitch shot over this bunker, lands on the green soft, rolls up the hole, and falls in. Wow. I'm like, holy shit! And for some reason, like then, right there, like that moment was just like. I'm such a little douche. Like I need to stop being a douche because you never know what's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, and uh, like that moment has always stuck, stuck in my head. Yeah, yeah. that's really cool. Yeah. Um, tell me about where we can find you if people are listening and they maybe want to get a lesson or what what you got going on now. Um, so you can find me on Instagram at at Nick Boba Golf. Uh, you can DM me there, or I also have a, a link through there. You can actually get my cell phone on my email. Mm -hmm. uh, you could find me on nickbovagolf.com. Uh, it's uh, there's just some basic information, kind of as to what I what I do, and and a little bit on my background and where you can contact me as well. Uh, you could also contact me. Uh, I have a business page, Nick Bova Golf, on Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, Nick Bova on LinkedIn, or um, I mean, hell, you can show me an email, too. Um, I remember I asked you this. Number one, you work at Hamilton Farm, but you don't need to be a member there to take a lesson with you. Correct, correct. I get that question a lot, actually. So um, probably 70% of my, my lessons are not members. Got it. So it's a, it's a high percentage. So, yeah, if, you, if, if you're a non-member, you don't have to worry. Yeah. Um, we'll let you through the gate. That's right. <laughs> and then the other part about your lessons that I want people to understand too is and it's kind of what we try to do here it's that as much as it is about the hour that you're with them it's really not and I hope I'm not promoting something that you don't want to be doing but I mean everyone that comes in when they're done with their lesson it's hey when you start to practice and take this with you take some videos send it to me and I've done this with you almost every time yeah. and you'll give me the next step so yeah. um, the best compliment I I what I want people to say about me is I'm not cheap, but I'm really good. And yeah. Your lessons aren't cheap, but but it's really good because yeah. it's not just the hour. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's I look at it as more like, yeah, you're going to pay $200 for an hour, yeah. right? But I'm also giving you the time outside of that to where I offer for people to send me a down-the-line video and a face-on, and, you know, I'll... I get a lot of them a day, but I'll get to it. Yes. I'll get back to you. You know, so I offer because I want to. Yes. Because I don't want I don't want my players to, um, I don't want my players to get to a certain point and feel like they're stuck, mm -hmm. or I don't want them to misconstrue the information that we talked about, and then they have a question and they don't they don't ask. Right. Like there's so many times I've had people say, you know, I just felt weird texting you. I'm like, I offered it. Yes. If I offer it, do it. Like, you know, I give you my phone number for a reason. So, um, yeah, no, I, it's, it's, it's a big part of it. It's, it's more of the coaching model. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll hit you when you come, but I'm also going to give you some love when you're not. Well, uh, you can ask Hannah. We talk about in our team meetings, cost versus value. And yeah. I went to get a lesson with someone else before I saw you, which was significantly cheaper. And after I saw you for the first time, I said to myself, I wasted more money going to the first place. That was a quarter of the price. Yeah. Because I didn't get any out of it. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, who the hell cares? Yeah. Yeah. It's your it's your time and your money. You know, like the way I look at it is if somebody's going to come and spend $200 for an hour with me, I'm going to give you everything I can in an hour. Yeah. Right. So I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to skip you on time. I'm not going to skip you on the effort. Like it's it's going to be there. Um, 
So if I'm going to bring it, I expect you to bring it too. And then the other part too is that your Instagram, the reason why you have so many followers is because the amount of content that you're putting out there. Um, what I find is things that I'm working on, I find it in the videos that you're teaching other people. And so I can usually watch you go through it with someone else and say, oh, okay, that's a different maybe way to say it or a different feel. So there's a lot of ways to learn that don't involve just the one hour. Yeah, yeah. It's um, Instagram is great for filtering out information, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I remember going through, this is probably a couple months ago, I went through like 10 different posts consecutively where I'm talking about the same thing but doing it differently. Mm -hmm. And I sat back and I thought about it. I'm like, God, like, literally, I just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. But then I look back at each one and I'm like, okay, well, there's something different about this. There's something different about this. There's something different about this that might actually continue to pertain to somebody else. Yeah. Right? That might, you know, the way I say one thing on how I want somebody to pivot might not connect with Justin, but it could connect with Hannah. Sure. You know what I mean? So, um, so I, I think, you know, when I look back at it, like those, those, I think it was actually like nine posts. I think those nine posts are actually some of like the best stuff I've done. Yeah. Just because it's, um, I'm, tr I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hit like a, a wider range of people. Right. You know? Exactly. So yeah. it's, it's that, I mean, Instagram's a beautiful thing. It's good. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's, good. it's got a good thing going there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so at Nick Boba Golf, guys, if mm -hmm. you want more information, they can, first of all, like your page, is that what you do now? Subscribe, like, follow, follow, oh, follow. Yeah, <laughs> super age. Uh, and then uh, follow Nick. And if you want more information or want to take a lesson, you're running right PPAC Hamilton Farm, mm -hmm. uh, which is a cool place to go over. And so, Nick, we appreciate you being on. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate yeah. it. And we'll, we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you, man. Yeah. That was good. Cool. Thanks, man. That was okay.